Colorado promises to protect whistleblowers who raise concerns about government. A lawsuit questions whether that's true. The reason some Coloradans are not getting the full tax refund, as the state and Walmart finally admit there was a problem getting checks cashed there. Rental properties in Denver need to provide heat and running water. Pretty basic, right? Now it's the law. And it is the most ridiculous political controversy in a long time. We are all dumber for it, but we'll try to emerge smarter after another edition of Next. Whistleblower laws in Colorado offer more protection since the pandemic. In the last two years, state legislators gave public employees additional protections if they raise concerns. But a case that started during the pandemic shows that workers who speak up are only protected so far. Our Marshall Zellinger explains. Federal grant money comes with specific rules. When Dr. Tony Capello became the state health department's director of disease and control and health response, he found federal money being spent funny. There was a lot of uh, money, millions of dollars that were off the books, not being properly tracked, properly managed. He said the state was using Ryan White HIV AIDS program dollars outside of what was allowed. That money was supposed to be used for those living with an HIV diagnosis. He found millions being spent on HIV prevention and the medicine PrEP. PrEP is used to prevent HIV, so it's, it would be used on people who do not have an HIV uh, diagnosis. To make a long story short, he was put on leave, then fired by the state health director, Dr. Jill Hunsaker Ryan. Last year, there was a week long hearing to determine if his whistleblower lawsuit could continue. During that hearing, Dr. Ryan admitted federal rebate dollars could not be spent on PrEP and said Dr. Capello was fired because he had lost her trust and broke the trust of the community. The judge in the 2021 hearing ruled the case could continue. It has dragged out, creating lots of paper that can fill a large binder. Two weeks ago, the same judge ruled that any damages are limited by the state's Governmental Immunity Act, $387,000, and that each party is responsible for their own attorney fees and costs. The cost of attorney's fees over two years uh, is substantially greater than the cap. That means the whistleblower who is using state law to fight back is also limited by state law for what he can receive. You don't have to make money on a situation like this. I just want to be made whole. In a situation like this, um, it really deters um, and, and really has me going back and thinking, should I have done the right thing? I probably would still do the right thing. Uh, but what I would hope is that um, the legislature would see the concerns that, that have come out of this case specifically. As it relates to this case, Dr. Capello is now in the negative. The cost of the case, which we can get into in another story, is more than he can get based on state law. Democratic State Senator Robert Rodriguez sponsored the law about stronger whistleblower protections during COVID. I reached out to him today. He's going to look at this and see if there's more state law that is needed to, to give the idea of like, hey, if you're going to blow the whistle, you're not going to get priced out if it takes too long. Sure. And the fact is, people in state government are going to hear about this case or they're going to see this story and they're going to realize, oh, if the state just wants to, to drag this out, then I may not be protected in the end. And he just, you know, Dr. Capello just said, let it be case by case. Let, let, let the judge see each case and determine whether or not the limit, the government immunity limit is applied to that case versus another case because 387 does sound like a lot of money, $387,000. It's in an account waiting for him if he wants it. He could appeal and try to take this beyond where we're at right now. Something for state legislators to talk about at least. All right, thank you, Marshall. Colorado's Democratic Party is defending indicted Senator Pete Lee of Colorado Springs, saying that Lee needs to be able to present his side of the story after he was charged with a felony for registering to vote at an address where he admits he doesn't live. Senator Pete Lee has worked tirelessly to advance justice and opportunity, the party's new statement today said. We hope as the legal process unfolds, Senator Lee will be given a fair opportunity to present all the facts in this case. Previously, the Colorado Democratic Party falsely claimed that it was not aware of Lee's residency issue. We obtained an audio tape from 2020 where Senator Lee discusses getting help from the Colorado Democratic Party's attorney on the issue. He admitted on this tape that he doesn't ever spend the night at this property where he claimed to live and voted. And clearly, from this tape, Lee knew the stakes. The real threat is it's a felony five to vote in from a district that you don't live in. A felony, class five, is in fact what Senator Lee is facing. He's issued a statement through his attorney in which he does not deny that he voted from an address where he doesn't live. Lee's attorney instead suggested that the charge was politically motivated because the prosecutor is a Republican. 
We've been getting flooded with questions lately about the tax refund check showing up in your mailboxes, the Tabor refunds. A few people told us they did not get the full amount. Now, the first thing I did is call the information line, and after getting through all of their, you know, long recording at the beginning, they're like, you know, the, the minimum wait time is 50 minutes. And I'm like, that's like more minutes than dollars I'm asking about. <laughs> so kind of a little absurd. More minutes than dollars because Lori Links Murphy received $705 instead of the full $750 that single filers are supposed to get. Different next viewer told us they got $1,000 and uh, $1,005 instead of the $1,500. The state says we're not looking at typos here. If you did not get the full amount, it may be because you owed back taxes or had other debts to various state agencies. That could be child support, unpaid student loans, judicial fines, or even parking tickets. The state is taking that money out of the Tabor refund checks. Also, following up on one of your more persistent issues with these refunds, Coloradans heading to Walmart to cash their checks should have an easier time. After days where they told us that there was not a problem, the state and Walmart now say, there was a problem. It was with the magnetic ink character recognition, which is used to process the checks. Walmart says its system incorrectly flagged some of those checks. They tell us they have fixed it and it should be working again. Several of you, including an ex viewer named Gwen, asked us why people who do not pay state income taxes are getting one of these refunds. The State Department of Revenue tells us that is because the Tabor refund comes from extra state revenue from all sources. So we're talking sales tax, fuel taxes, marijuana taxes, alcohol taxes, not just income tax. If you have not yet received your check, the state says it should be on the way. The Department of Revenue says if you don't see it by August 30th, then contact that call center with the ridiculous wait time. For now, they're still sending out the checks. We've gotten all kinds of questions about this. We actually got some movement there from Walmart in the state. We'll tackle some more of your questions tomorrow. And if you have a new one for us, just email to next at 9news.com. Running water and heat are pretty basic. Denver wants to make sure that all rental properties in the city have those things. Thousands of rental properties might end up operating illegally if the landlords don't act quickly to get a new license. Here's Kitty Eastman. Time is running out for thousands of rental properties to get licensed before the end of the year. Is it going to the printing presses today? And Eric Escadero with Denver's Department of Excise and Licensing. We just constantly think about what's the barriers. He's trying to get the word out with 40,000 mailers about to be sent. Well, we knew it was going to be a challenging license. I and mean, when you're talking about the largest expansion of required business licensing in the history of Denver, we knew this wasn't going to be uh, easy as, as pie. Because of a city council ordinance that passed last year, Escadero estimates 25,000 multi-unit rental properties will be required to get licensed by January 1st. So far, his office has only issued 200 licenses. And we're afraid that there will be a surge of thousands of license applications in November and December. And they'll go and they'll try to get the required inspection. And we're worried that the inspectors will be overwhelmed. But where the city sees a potential backlog. Independent code council certified R5 inspectors. Andy Rhodes found a business opportunity. We built our company just to handle this exact situation. He created CCI after Denver passed this new law, knowing inspectors would be in short supply. Were those on the list? All these people are studying to be inspectors specifically to fill the gap the residential rental property license created. We'll be able to do 9,000 inspections between October 1 and the end of this year. We'll be able to do another 9,000 in the first three months of next year. With just 20 weeks to go, both Rhodes and the city also worry about how many reinspections might be needed if properties fail the first time. Enforcement is always a big question, and it will be complaint-based from tenants. But Eric said it will also be similar to their short-term rental enforcement, where they use a computer software company to look for listings. That will automatically compare the address to the licensing database, and it'll prompt the city to reach out, Kyle, if that address isn't licensed. This is a 
ton of work for the city to keep track of. I mean, they must have some other pretty large licensed databases. Yeah, so right now the largest license in Denver is for security guards. It's a little under 7,000 licenses. But the last time there was this race to get as many businesses as possible licensed was in 2013 when medical marijuana companies were trying to get recreational licenses. Eric says this rental property license is like that, yeah. but on performance enhancing drugs. Ah, yes, like, like drugs, but on drugs. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Katie, thank you. <laughs> I'm Michael Bennett. I approve this message, and I've caught that fish. A super awkward but completely non-controversial political ad has led to one of the dumbest fake controversies we remember. The Broncos are getting ready to host the Cowboys. Next viewers have asked whether the entire stadium will be ready to go after the springtime fire. And it's a sign we could all use a break from the heat. That's next. Getting some feedback tonight about a political ad that doesn't really make any controversial claims. It actually just shows a senator fishing. Mark Kenning wrote in to ask about Democratic Senator Michael Bennett's new ad talking about his environmental record. Mark writes, the current Bennett commercial shows him catching a fish. She insists he caught it, making me think he seldom actually ca catches fish. Makes me wonder, does he have a fishing license? Well, Mark, the answer to that question leads us into one of the silliest fake scandals we've seen in Colorado politics. We all know what happens when a senator goes to Washington. Special interests get their hooks in them, and they get caught in the mess. The ad shows Democratic Senator Michael Bennett fly fishing, presumably on the Arkansas, where unaffiliated Chafee County Commissioner Greg Felt, that guy, is a fishing guide. The ad talks about Bennett's environmental record. It shows him awkwardly casting like he just learned how to do it, and it ends with, I'm Michael Bennett. I approve this message, and I've caught that fish. Republicans seem convinced this is Michael Bennett's Watergate. Does he have a fishing license? Yes. The campaign told Axios he purchased a one-day fishing license. Aha! A one-day license, not an annual license. The Colorado Republican Party put out a press release on this, an actual press release that no sh says Bennett isn't a fly fisherman. Then the National Republican Party weighed in, saying Bennett isn't a Colorado man through and through because he only had a one-day fishing license. Conservative media articles followed. Fox News <laughs> Channel had a field day. And I caught that fish. He couldn't catch a fish at Red Lobster. That's it's not clear how Republicans' here. fishing line of attack is polling with the 4.7% of Coloradans who have an annual fishing license, or whether they would prefer Republicans wade into more serious issues than Senator Bennett's Watergate. I'm wondering if any detail-oriented next viewers remembered why that river guide sounded familiar. Chafee County Commissioner Greg Felt is the same guy who unloaded on that concert promoter who sold more tickets than they were allowed under the pandemic restrictions. How many tickets have you sold so far? A little over 6,000, 1,300 local, 1,300. 6,000? Are you me? You know we have a 5,000 person event capacity and you've already sold more tickets than that? Yes. What the hell, Jim? The fishing guide in the ad is the what the hell, Jim guy. We have truly come full circle. It's been hot. I don't know. It might be nice to go fishing, right? Look at a snapshot of August. We've been looking at above average temperatures each and every day. Aside from last Sunday, today we hit 98 degrees out of DIA that shattered our previous record of 97. So once again, another re record breaker here in the city, and that's going to go down in the books. 100 in Greeley, we were in the 90s off to the eastern plains, even up into the high country. It was scorching hot, 91 in Steamboat through Kremlin Eagle, 100 degrees in Grand Junction with some 70s and 80s up in the mountains. We do have a couple of thunderstorms out there as we speak. Nothing severe at the moment, and everything is tracking off to the north and to the west. Kind of an interesting flow for many of us here in eastern Colorado. We're saying what storms it has been so hot and so dry. A few clouds kind of drifting in around Jefferson and Douglas County, but that's going to be about it. Give it a couple of hours. These thunderstorms will start to lay down and then by early tomorrow morning we are kicking off the day with plenty of sunshine and it's Friday, right? As we look at the afternoon, a couple of thunderstorms possible in around Grand Larimer counties around the burn scars. So we will be monitoring that. Otherwise should stay mainly dry. 
dry here in Denver and it will be another toasty afternoon for us by about 11 o'clock tomorrow night. Still potentially some lingering showers up in the mountains. Just kind of keep that in mind if you're doing any camping up there. High pressure is around, so that's going to keep us hot at least through the weekend with these above average temperatures. But I do have a really nice break coming our way as we look ahead toward next week. 99 tomorrow. Whew, I know triple digits around Sterling 90s into southeastern Colorado, some 70s and 80s up in the mountains. And then finally, early next week, the pattern shifts. I'll we'll be tracking a good chance of storms and highs in the 80s. Yes, the 80s. The new Broncos owners inherited some damaged goods, slightly burned and damaged mile high. Work to fix it is running right up to the first preseason game. And it's a sign that sometimes, you know, elk don't follow the rules. Next. The area around Ball Arena in Denver could look a lot different over the next few decades if Kroenke Sports gets its way on some development plans. They'd like to turn the parking lots and areas around the arena into a new multi-use development. Think stores, and bars, restaurants, office space, apartments, a park. The developers also want to sort of connect the Ball Arena area to Mile High and to Lodo. The idea is what they're calling the Sports Mile. It would stretch from Mile High to Coors Field. Development is still in the very early stages. This is all part of a 20-year plan for the area. It would mean big changes, though, for streets and parking and transportation around Ball Arena. Our next question tonight is from Shirley, Lance, Dusty, about the repairs at Mile High. They all wondered, will the damage, the burned area of the stadium, be open to fans? Shirley, Lance, Dusty, we think so. So during a meeting last week, the Metropolitan Football Stadium District said that the seats that were burned up in the fire in the spring will be repaired and ready in time for Saturday. You recall last March, there was all that smoke coming out of Mile High. People were making jokes about how we got a new quarterback or whatever, you know, or a new owner, like uh, the uh, smoke the Vatican. The smoke and fire damaged eight suites, nearly 200 seats within the stadium. It might have been some metal work being done on the club lounge to spark the fire. Since then, workers have been repairing the stadium, replacing the seats, and the stadium district insists that they'll be ready to go for Saturday's preseason game. The view, though, from Sky 9 shows there are still some seats missing and work to be done over the next couple of days. We have a sign for you of the toll that heat's taken on Colorado's wildlife. That and your feedback next. It's a sign that either elk don't know how to read or they don't care. The sign outside Estes Park United Methodist Church clearly says loading and unloading zone. Uh, the elk are taking a load off. Does that count? Unclear. Probably they just want a shady spot on a hot day. Thanks to Jake and Donna Meyer for sharing that. Looks like a similar strategy for the deer that Miles Mallon saw on the CU campus. Either they wanted some shade or they're trying to check out the Sustainability Energy and Environment Laboratory building on CU's campus. If you have a sign or something cool you want to share, email it to next at 9news.com. Or you can always use the hashtag. Hey, next. A lot of feedback tonight about Republicans trying to insist that Democratic Senator Michael Bennett is not a real Colorado man because he had got a one day fishing license to shoot his his fishing themed commercial. Uh, Jericho says how to judge who is a real Colorado man trademark whose Subaru is muddier. Angie, though, thinks they have a point. She said just be authentic. He's either an outdoorsman or he's not. No one likes a fraud. I'm with Sarah LaMare, who suggested that we have some next themed merch over this and the, uh, the fishing guide that we know from his outburst previously. Sarah thinks we should sell t-shirts that say, what the hell, Jim, let's go fishing. I like that. Everybody will wear those. We'll see you next time.